morning, everybody. Uh, that was a nice, good crowd. I'm always worried about uh, will we get anybody, but thanks to many of our uh, instructors and maybe any of you who saw our publicity and were interested in coming, I think you'll get a lot out of it. Um, this is a part of a, a pro series of programs that we offer as part of uh, African American History Month, which we've done in this um, college for many, many years. And we do, uh, we've had some programs already, just a preview, ne not next week, uh, last week, last Thursday, and I don't get the exact date, last Thursday in um, February, we will have a, what's being termed a hip hop extravaganza in the cafeteria from 12 to three. So any of you who are available may want to take advantage of that as well. But this morning we have our, well we usually we have a keynote speaker and we're really happy that he agreed to come to speak to us. Um, his name is Dr. Corey Walker and he's a professor at Brown University in the uh, Department of Africana Studies. Uh, he's also a fellow of the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute at Harvard University. He's uh, well versed certainly in this area and he's written these two books and many articles in this, in this area. He also teaches uh, philosophy and religion. Um, so um, he teaches both undergraduate and graduate degrees in, um, in these areas, philosophy, religion, Africana studies. Any of you who are interested in going on sometime, transferring, may want to speak to him briefly, see what the possibilities are. Um, Dr. Walker has degrees from the College of William and Mary, which is in Virginia, um, he, from Harvard University, and from Virginia Union University and Norfolk State University as well. So he's been involved in both state schools as well as the Ivies. Um, before, before coming to Brown, he taught at the University of Virginia and was also a visiting professor at the University of Jena in Germany. Um, his topic today is W.E.B. Du Bois and the Future of Democracy uh, in America and probably in the world. Uh, this is a subject which uh, those of you following the news has even greater meaning given the events that we've been seeing in Egypt and um, around the Middle East, still going on today. Um, so I know Dr. Walker has a sort of prepared speech, but he wants to open it up and have a discussion. So as he talks and thinks about these things, think about questions that you may want to ask and a dialogue that we can have. Uh, so we're really pleased to have Dr. Walker here. Thank you. First of all, let me thank Ron for inviting me out uh, to uh, join you today to engage in a conversation. Uh, I was telling him as we walked around campus and as he showed me uh, the fine campus that you have here uh, that early in my career I just uh, wanted to, I pursued a job at Tidewater Community College. And uh, unfortunately they never called me back and I couldn't get a job at T Tidewater Community College. And uh, I still, uh, uh, I, I'm still very interested in Tidewater Community College. Uh, uh, the president there, Deborah DeCroce, is uh, a wonderful leader, and she's done uh, amazing things at TCC. And if you have a chance, uh, uh, if you're ever in the Norfolk area, Norfolk, Virginia area, uh, the Norfolk campus is one of the uh, fine campuses of the TCC system. Uh, it's built right in downtown Norfolk in a number of uh, uh, renovated buildings. Uh, and they've cr now they've built their first uh, student center. So in as much as I'm at Brown University, uh, my heart uh, and my mind is turning south uh, towards how can I get to uh, Tidewater Community College. And it's going to be a bit difficult because we're in uh, some economic uh, constraints down in Virginia. Uh, so uh, hopefully they'll be able to find a space for me down there uh, and I can uh, get back down to my hometown in Norfolk. Today what I'd like to do is to have us uh, talk about uh, a very interesting figure in global history. 
He's none other than William Edward Burghardt Du Bois. And Du Bois, we're going to use Du Bois as an occasion to begin to think about and rethink uh, what I've termed the promise of American democracy. Now, interestingly enough, the title of this talk, uh, the full title, uh, is not W.E.B. Du Bois and the Promise of American Democracy, but it is uh, a title that is prefaced by democracy or empire with a question mark. And the reason it is prefaced that way is because we want to begin to rethink how we conceive of democracy both as an intellectual project and as a political practice. Uh, come on in, we, we just getting started here. It's amazing how everyone always goes to the back and never to the front. I know we have some sociologically oriented students who would do a wonderful study to figure that out. It happens everywhere. And you're like, what's wrong with the front right here? You're scared. I see you're right here with me. It's like, I'm getting a front row seat. Man, I can read it right off the paper. The rest of y'all are just trying to listen. I get the textual dementia. Uh, for those who just walked in the room, the full uh, title of this talk is Democracy or Empire, uh, with a question mark. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and the Promise of American Democracy. In many ways, the last half of the 20th century and the opening up, opening decade of the 21st century has been a momentous occasion. We have witnessed in the post-World War II world the decolonization of many areas around the globe, from Southeast Asia to the Indian continent, the Indian subcontinent, to countries throughout Africa. We've seen D uh, democracy open up in spaces where we would not have imagined uh, democratic, uh, democratic forms of governance to open up. And in the opening days of the 21st century and in the opening month of this year, the January 25th, 2011 revolution in Egypt, we have found ourselves witnesses to what happens when people begin to take political power in their own hands and begin to refashion and reimagine forms of political community, forms of political solidarity, and forms, uh, different forms of their political obligations. However, inasmuch as we see these events from the decolonization and independence of Ghana in 1957 to the revolution that we've just witnessed in Egypt uh, beginning January 25th, uh, 2011, we are reminded that in each instance, the political community that forms and the political community that results are not predetermined formations. As the writer Asim El Kesh and Al Haram Weekly writes, revolutions are mysterious creatures. They do not come with instruction manuals or in any one shape or form. Therefore, in the midst of a revolution, it is never easy to predict what might come next or how it will morph. As we celebrate or as we recognize the beginning of the American Civil War, the 150th anniversary of the beginnings of the American Civil War, we're reminded that many of the founding fathers of this nation would never have imagined a civil war occurring. Many of our founding fathers would not have imagined the death, the toll upon the American nation, nor would they have imagined how America would be reconstructed. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments that were added to the Constitution fundamentally reorganized American political culture and, Ameri and the American polity. In many ways, what happened at the beginning uh, in, in South Carolina, and that culminated in Appomattox, Virginia, fun, was not an event that could have been a calculated when our founding fathers sat down to write the Declaration of Independence. And inasmuch as the Reconstruction era challenges us and strains our imaginations, 
it serves as an opportunity for us to begin to rethink that very experiment, that audacious experiment that we call democracy. One of the interesting individuals who used this period in American history not so much to begin to think about America in an exceptionalist manner, but to begin to fundamentally recast what democracy meant was none other than William Edward Burghardt Du Bois. Born in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, Du Bois was educated at Fisk University in Tennessee. He went on to uh, attain his master's and doctorate from Harvard University in 1895. He studied at the University of Berlin from 1892 to 1894 and completed all of the requirements for the doctorate. Remember, the latter part of the 19th century, Harvard was not the best university in the world. As a matter of fact, there's this interesting story that Du Bois uh, tells about his time at Harvard and uh, his uh, receiving his doctorate from uh, Harvard University. Because Du Bois had completed all of his doctoral work and, and completed a dissertation uh, at the University of Berlin, which at the end of the 19th century, Germany was the premier country and destination for higher education throughout the entire world. And to receive a doctorate from the University of Berlin placed you in the upper echelons of education globally. Du Bois, unfortunately, needed to, uh, the faculty uh, at the University of Berlin voted that Du Bois needed to stay an additional semester. He would have completed his doctorate in four semesters at the University of Berlin. But Du Bois needed more money. In order to stay that extra semester, he wrote to his uh, fellowship, uh, the Slater Fund, who offered him fellowship uh, monies to study in, in Berlin and said, I need one more semester of uh, fellowship funds so I can complete my doctorate uh, here at the University of Berlin. How many of us ever been in a situation where we just need a little bit more money to complete that degree? I mean, so you're not, you're not alone in this. I remember I constantly begged uh, my scholarship funders, you know, I need more money to get my undergraduate degree. But Du Bois got his degree, uh, Du Bois uh, asked for money and they said, well, you really don't need a PhD from the University of Berlin. You're a Negro. Why don't you just come back to the US and get your degree from Harvard? So Du Bois always says he settled for a degree from Harvard University. And when I'm up at the Du Bois Institute, I always remind uh, 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 Skip Gates that Du Bois always settled for his degree from Harvard. But Du Bois, uh, du Bois was not only uh, well-educated. Uh, his, first, his first book, The Suppression of the African Slave Trade, uh, which was published in 1896, served as the first book in the Harvard Historical Studies series. He wrote the first work of empirical sociology uh, in, in U.S. history in 1899. The book is entitled The Philadelphia Negro. In 1903, his classic text that most everyone reads, a collection of 13 essays, uh, is uh, collected under the title The Souls of Black Folk. He also wrote a book that we'll talk about, uh, Black Reconstruction, which recasts uh, Reconstruction historiography, how America came to uh, arrest, arrest the development of democracy in the post-Civil War era. He also wrote another book, 10 Years After Black Reconstruction, that we'll talk about as well, Color and Democracy. And this book was about the Dumbarton Oaks Conference, uh, looking at the post-World War II world where Du Bois set out to begin to offer an alternative vision of post-World War II world and not a vision of empire that he challenged. But in many ways, Du Bois, throughout his career, uh, both as an intellectual and an activist, he helped found the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. He was an individual instrumental uh, in bringing together uh, conferences, the Pan-African Conferences, beginning in 1900 and, of course, in 1919, 1923, 1927, and the uh, Pan-African Congress uh, in Manchester in 1945. The, uh, the uh, All Races Conference, which brought together uh, colonized people from around the world in 1911 in London, Du Bois was uh, very instrumental in. So in many ways, Du Bois's life 
was preoccupied with this question around democracy. It was not something that was given. In many ways, Walt Whitman in his, Democratic Vis in his book, Democratic Vistas from 1871, reminds us that although we see this word uh, frequently printed, democracy, Whitman says, I cannot too often repeat that it is a word, the real gist of which sleeps quite unawakened. Notwithstanding the resonance and the many angry tempests out of which its syllables have come from pen or tongue, it is a great word whose history, I suppose, remains unwritten because that history has yet to be enacted. Du Bois recognized that inasmuch as there's uh, this robust conversation around discourse, around democ discourse around democracy, it is a word and a political form that has yet to be instantiated. So if we think with Du Bois, we can use Du Bois as an invitation to begin to recast how we understand democracy, to think differently about democracy, to begin to pursue democracy as a necessary experiment and an unfinished task. In many ways, Du Bois's Black Reconstruction in America serves as this wonderful staging of how we begin to rethink democracy. Du Bois is pursuing a line of questioning that's inaugurated in his 1896 text, The Suppression of the African Slave Trade. In that text, Du Bois raises the question, how far in a state can a recognized moral wrong safely be compromised? Du Bois was talking about the moral wrong of chattel slavery. In many ways, the question of how far, can a, how far in a state can a moral wrong be safely compromised challenges us today. When we think of the moral wrongs that go on in our everyday lives, that are very much a part of our everyday existence, not only here in uh, Fall River, Massachusetts, but throughout America and throughout the world, the question that we have to ask as members of a political community is, how far do we sit idle and allow the moral wrongs to continue to perpetuate themselves? The challenge is not just upon our political leaders. The challenge becomes part of who we are and what we do. In his notes on the state of Virginia, Thomas Jefferson reminded us that the moral wrong to which Du Bois uh, recognized was a catastrophic calamity that may be the fate of America. Jefferson writes, deep-rooted prejudices entertained, entertained by whites, 10,000 recollections by blacks of the injuries they have sustained, will divide us into parties and produce convulsions which will probably never end but in the extermination of one or the other race. Jefferson highlights the fact, the contentious issues around anti-black racism that has infected the American experiment with democracy. In many ways, Jefferson doesn't read it as something exceptional. He doesn't read it as something that's an additive he reads it as something that is very constitutive of our political experiment. Du Bois uses this as a moment to begin to re fundamentally reimagine what democracy is. Black Reconstruction in America tells the story of a democracy that's in its fledgling form. A democracy built on an egalitarianism, built on an, a radical equality, built on not only a political equality, but also an economic equality. And all of a sudden, that experiment in democracy is interrupted by the collapse of Reconstruction in 1876, by the end of Reconstruction in 1876. What Du Bois is writing about 
is how we can think through an intellectual practice and a political practice that can open up possibilities for something new. There are no guarantees. Du Bois does not write in the sense that here are the guarantees of which democracy will give us. And in many ways, we're seeing that right now. And this is what uh, Asim El Khesh writes about uh, in uh, uh, Al Haram Weekly, that there are no guarantees about democracy. Du Bois wants us to begin to look at how a moment in American history opened up possibilities and how that moment uh, closes uh, very quickly. In many ways, uh, Martin Luther King gives voice to this moment with extreme clarity. The promise, the possibilities, and also the perils. In his book, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community, King reflects on this post-emancipation period with extreme clarity. He writes, with all the beautiful promise that Frederick Douglass saw in the Emancipation Proclamation, he soon found that it left the Negro with only abstract freedom. Four million newly liberated slaves found themselves with no bread to eat, no land to cultivate, no shelter to cover their heads. It was like freeing a man who had been unjustly imprisoned for years and on discovering his innocence, sending him out with no bus fare to get home, no suit to cover his body, no financial compensation to atone for his long years of incarceration and to help him get a sound footing in society, sending him out with only the assertion, now you are free. What greater injustice could society perpetuate? All the moral voices of the universe, all the codes of jurisprudence would rise up with condemnation of such an act. Yet this is exactly what America did to the Negro. In 1863, the Negro was given abstract freedom expressed in luminous rhetoric. But in an agrarian economy, he was given no land to make liberation concrete. After the war, the government granted white settlers without cost millions of acres of land in the West, thus providing America's new white peasants from Europe with an economic floor. But at the same time, its oldest peasantry, the Negro, was denied everything but a legal status he could not use, could not consolidate, could not even defend. As Frederick Douglass came to say, Emancipation granted the Negro freedom to hunger, freedom to winter amid the rains of heaven. Emancipation was freedom and famine at the same time. What King reminds us of and what Du Bois uh, tries to highlight is that this moment in American history was not some teleological moment in a journey of America's fulfillment of the promise of democracy. Instead, it was a moment in the continual experiment with a form of political community that also served as a test for how robust a political community we will develop. In many ways, Du Bois highlights the potential of democracy. America as a potential democratic nation. In his book of 1945, Color and Democracy, Colonies and Peace, Du Bois stages a return to this moment of reconstruction as a moment to begin to elaborate what would happen in the post-World War II world. And he writes, the problem of reconstruction of the United States in 1876 is the problem of reconstruction of the world in 1943. Color and democracy reminds us of the limitations of our political community, the limitations of our political imaginations, the limitations of our political horizons, 
and it opens us up to new possibilities of how we should develop our political community how we should stage not only what we do in the United States and how we organize ourselves in the US, but how we organize ourselves around the globe. This book, Color and Democracy, reminds us that in this war, we face the last problem of democracy. Du Bois, of course, ends this book or open, uh, ends the middle uh, chapter four of this book with this stirring question. How far are we working for a world where the peoples who are ruled are going to have effective voice in their governments? That is a question that continues to face us today. That is a question that we see working itself out in other countries around the globe. And that is a question to which we are constantly confronting here in our United States of America. But Du Bois also reminds us that in as much as there are perils to democracy, that democracy is a, has a infinite potential, it is also best structured around a promise. And that means that democracy is an expression of something that is to come. It is not an expression that democracy has arrived. It is something that we aspire to, something that we continually journey, uh, continually engage in a journey. In many ways, democracy reminds us, the promise of democracy reminds us that we have to be open to new experiences. We have to be open to new ideas. We have to be open to new ways of life. Democracy is not something that is closed off, sealed up, finished, and contained for us to just posit for one generation to the next. In many ways, as a promise, democracy is renewed with each generation, receiving the gift of that promise and then pursuing that promise in ways in which a previous generation could never have imagined. Democracy reminds us that we are heirs to an entire world of ideas. We are heirs to a political practice that is far from finished. We are heirs to ways of thinking and ways of being in the world that we respond to in an unpredictable and unknown manner. In many ways, in order to inhabit this space of democracy, we have to be humble. We have to be hospitable. And we have to continue to engage uh, in a hope-filled experiment that we're all uh, heirs to. Thus, we end with a question. Du Bois raises the issue about uh, democracy in, the, in America in light, of the, in light of the Reconstruction moment. He challenges us to press on with democracy in the post-World War II moment. And our moment, when we see new political formations emerging, the question for us is, whither our democracy? Do we continue along the path that we have set or that has been set for us, or do we continue to develop this promise of democracy that is yet to come? By posing the question, we are reminded that democracy is a journey and not a final destination. We have not ended this experiment. There are many issues that confront us as a nation and that confront us as a global community. The question that you face, that Du Bois enables us to think through is, what or how will you, be, how will you imagine democracy in your time and in the time to come? Thank you.
Now, I've taken sort of a, a different track on the on on this talk. All too often in these uh, Black History Month lectures, you find yourself dealing with uh, uh, what I would call the exceptional Negro syndrome. You find, let's go find someone to tell us how exceptional African Americans are and what pathologies plague black communities that we need to face. Du Bois uh, is not that type of thinker. And in many ways, uh, what we think of as Black History Month coming out of the thought of Carter G. Woodson uh, with National Negro History Week is a moment where we can actually imagine a new world and a new possibility. It is not just a moment of celebration. It stands as a moment of challenge. And in many ways, we have this annual commemoration uh, for a way of thinking quite differently about our world. And if it becomes just a ritual, then uh, I've always been hesitant to accept lecture engagements because I said, you know, I really don't want to participate in that. But this year I said, okay, I'll do it. But only in the sense that we challenge ourselves to think differently about ourselves and our world. And in many ways, this is what, this is what Du Bois does. He uses this moment, the moment of uh, African-American political, African-American freedom, to begin to open up a new vista of freedom and a new vista of democracy, uh, not only for the US, not only for African Americans, but also for the world. So you should go back to your classes. Uh, we can have a conversation now about how we can actually begin to change uh, our world, possibly beginning right here at Bristol Community College in, in some of our classes, uh, not to be too subversive. <laughs> Anyone have any questions, comments? Uh, for conversation. Well, I, I just have an observation that I was, I'm surprised mm -hmm. that Du Bois was optimistic about democracy, considering what he must have witnessed. I think by 1900, there were no blacks in the state legislature and no blacks in the U.S. Senate or House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, two things first. Democracy was never just something in America. Du Bois never equated uh, America with democracy as an absolute form. America just became uh, one particular place of a possibility of democracy. Du Bois was a global thinker. So as early as 1900, he was in Paris. Uh, uh, helping organize with Sylvester Williams and Anna Julia Cooper, the first Pan-African uh, Congress. This was about bringing a new form of political community to the world. Of course, he understood what happened in the U.S. Democracy had been aborted. I mean, uh, the slaughterhouse cases in the early 1870s gutted the Reconstruction Amendments. What we see in 1881, what we see in 1890 in Mississippi, what we see in 1896 in Plessy v. Ferguson, what we see by 1905 where there's uh, disfranchisement across the entire South. If Du Bois had taken that as the example, as the pinnacle of democracy, if he had taken the U.S. as the only instance of democracy in the world, there would be no need to even think of it. But Du Bois presses the case that Look, what happens in Reconstruction, what happened when African Americans uh, under Francis L. Cardoza in South Carolina made uh, public education available for everyone. I mean, this is, interestingly enough, we have these debates around public education today. And uh, we have all of these proposals. I serve as the president of my daughter's PTO at uh, Martin Luther King Elementary School in, in Providence. And I'm always amazed at how we develop uh, these new ideas uh, about education, but yet we don't want to look at education itself, the content. So we want to teach students these uh, you know, facts and figures, but we don't want to teach them how to think. 
And in many ways, to teach a person how to think is a revolutionary act. What Du Bois does is causes us to think that democracy is not just, democracy is not synonymous with America. Hence, the title of his book is Black Reconstruction in America, an essay towards which blacks uh, work to make democracy uh, in America. It is not a done deal. It, was an exper it is an experiment. It is a journey. And Du Bois held out the possibility, the promise, because Du Bois believed in one thing, that democracy is not uh, codified and consolidated within just the formal institutions of politics proper. Democracy is a deep belief, a deep and abiding belief in the power of people. In his book, Black Reconstruction, it is about people. He opens up the first chapter is entitled, The Black Worker. This is a belief in the profound ability of everyday people to forge new forms of solidarity and new forms of community when people desire. So in a sense, Du Bois becomes a radical Democrat, unlike anything that we can account for. In many ways, the categories of thought that we have around politics make, uh, frame, a, frame a political community that creates this hierarchy where those who hold office are the individuals that we need to know, and the people just become a referent that we don't even need to know. And I'm always um, reminded that the Constitution, the preamble to the Constitution begins with those words, we the people. If we think of democracy as we the people, what's happening in Tunisia, what's happening in Egypt, becomes not just something over there and we say, oh, they're moving towards democracy. No, it actually they serve as uh, teachers for us and remind us that it, we as the people constitute this political community. As we see budget cuts coming down uh, from the state legislatures to uh, our federal uh, government, we the people organize this nation. If we don't like it, we the people need to do something about it. Du Bois calls us back to democracy as promised that is open, that is a journey and that is never finished, and that no one can usurp the power of people coming together. That's what Black Reconstruction is about. And that's what uh, Color and Democracy, his book on colonies and peace and the post-World uh, post War II period is about. Du Bois had a profound belief in the power of individuals coming together and changing their communities at any instance. And in many ways, if we begin to recast the Civil War and Reconstruction, not in this sort of hagiographic manner that it's been being uh, recast in, say, the New York Times, where you have all of these uh, historians writing about what the Civil War meant, making history boring. I mean, eyes glazed over. And some of the writings are just bad. I mean, I, I saw one. Uh, essay in there by Stephen Hahn, I said, well, you know, we could have just put an excerpt from Du Bois's Black Reconstruction in there. We didn't need him to write this. Uh, if we think about it as how people are trying to organize a new form of community, if we imagine ourselves, uh, if we can actually imagine a new world and thinking of how black people begin to fundamentally reconstruct democracy, not just for black people, not in a vengeful manner, but in a hopeful manner for all people. Imagine what that lesson will be for everyone uh, in our nation and in our world today. America doesn't hold a copyright on democracy. Let me, let, I'll, I'll say that again. America don't hold a copyright. America is not the pinnacle of, of democracy in the world. People hold new possibilities of democracy within themselves. And the challenge is for us to become true radical Democrats. That's what Du Bois challenged. That's the promise of democracy. Not that America is some exceptional uh, uh, formation, but that each person is an exceptional individual 
that can possibly open up a new uh, new possibilities for us. Incivility within the political sphere, the way politicians talk to each other and the things that they say about each other. And I'm thinking in one particular case when um, President Obama was giving a speech to the um, House. Oh, the State of the Union. And, oh, and somebody, somebody screamed out. You lie. You lie. Oh, that was civil compared to instances in American history. I mean, people, you know, they used to have, they used to have all out fights uh, in the floor of the Congress. Uh, I, I we have seen, duels, yeah. Because in my lifetime, yeah. I hadn't seen people screaming out things like that in a setting where you were supposed to be listening to the President of the United States and yeah. I mean, if you, I mean, always in the long view, things become this sort of relative moment. I mean, at the same time they're fighting uh, on the floor of the Congress in the 19th century, uh, you have slaveholders who are representing people. So it's like, okay, you know, really, can we use that as an adequate example? I mean, this is what we would expect. But in our recent moment, we have to begin to look at the role of uh, the role of media. Uh, in our, not only our political culture, but in our popular culture uh, broadly. In many ways, what media does is it, it, it reduces us to the least common denominator. Thus, we get stereotypes and we get caricatures instead of people. And as, me, as new media technologies eclipse time frames, time span, uh, mental frames, such that if you're on TV, uh, you always have to uh, find yourself doing things within a sound bite. It does not facilitate deep thinking. So, uh, for instance, uh, there's a TV show that comes on uh, NBC. Uh, so, who do you think you are? It's a genealogy show, right? Uh, about celebrities. Well, uh, I did I, I did the show with Lionel Richie that'll come on. Uh, I guess in a couple of weeks. And the one thing that I constantly had to uh, uh, make a point about was that you can't, although you have these time constraints, there's certain things that you can't say. There's certain things that give, uh, that miseducate individuals. There's certain ideas that can't be uh, expressed in uh, a nice, easy quip, uh, a nice, easy quip or a nice, easy phrase. In some ways, we have to do long thinking. Um, and our political culture, our media, our political culture is mediated through our mass media, is predicated on how do you get the greatest bang for the buck. So you don't have deep thinking going on. Uh, and it's not reinforced, I mean, in a sense, uh, as I told Ron, we were talking about, Ron asked me, do I have uh, any um, presentation, you know, any you know, I could have came up here with some slides and some PowerPoint. I said, really, I don't. I mean, uh, I just got some papers and some ideas. Uh, it's not that they don't help, but they, don't, they can't stand in place for thinking. And all too often, we've allowed uh, our media culture to stand in the place of our thinking. And it has, it, it has debilitated us to the degree that we uh, desire those quick responses. American political culture, I mean, democracy is, you know, a blood sport. I mean, it is about, it is contentious. Uh, throughout the history of ideas, uh, if you look at how democracy is organized, democracy as a pluralistic uh, experiment of different factions, different ideas, is a very contentious issue. 
But if we want to understand democracy and understand the different, the competing values within democratic culture, we have to begin to think quite differently about our democratic experiment. Now, relative to uh, President Obama, uh, this isn't something new in the political culture. Ron, the late Ron Walters, who's a political scientist, wrote a book on uh, uh, white supremacy and black interests. And he looked at the long 1980s and the long 1990s. And remember, in the 1980s, uh, in, the era, in the era of Reagan, uh, we had a long bout of anti-black, uh, anti-immigrant, uh, white nationalist sentiment. It expressed itself around uh, religion. Remember Jerry Falwell and the Moral Majority? Pat Robertson running for president in 1988? What we see now is we've had those analogs prior to. What we can't think through, what we fundamentally can't think through, is how do we begin to challenge the idea of white supremacy? This isn't a question about uh, uh, race in the abstract. This is a question about how do we fundamentally reorganize politics and power to eradicate white supremacy. Now, saying that won't get you, you know, too many speaking, speaking, speak, speaking engagements because everyone likes to talk about race, right? Let's have a discussion on race. And when we're really talking about what? Black people. <laughs> so we, we use the euphemism race but really we want to talk about black people and then we uh, string together a host of pathologies, bad education, poverty, um, uh, uh, incarceration, right? But never on the table is this issue of white supremacy. Hold up, folks. We have to begin to look at how our society reinforces an experience of white superiority that in a moment of challenge, Political challenge, I mean, this is what 2008 represents, that the premier office in the U.S. is no longer solely reserved for white men. This is a moment where you, know, you have people who are saying, this just can't happen. There's a fundamental challenge there. Ron Walters put his hand on it uh, in the 90s. There's a crisis in, in white supremacy, and this is what we're seeing playing itself out. This isn't, you know, about race, you know. I mean, I like to be ex extremely materialist in certain instances. This is really a question of the death of white supremacy and the last throes of it. And then we see it globally because the exercise of Europe and the U.S., uh, the foreign exercises of Europe and the U.S. now do not hold sway across the world. So how do we begin to fundamentally reorganize uh, ourselves as a political community and reorganize ourselves globally? I think that becomes the question. Not the question of incivility, the question of white supremacy. And we don't have the language to talk about that. And that's the challenge for students and for educators. How do we develop a language to talk about white supremacy? And I'm not talking about, you know, the Ku Klux Klansman that's hiding behind the door. I mean, that's like easy, you know. Or, you know, the, the member, you know, the, 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 the white militia group. I mean, that's just like too easy. Everybody wants to say, well, you know, I'm not, you know, ain't nobody a racist. I mean, we're talking about white supremacy. We're talking about values, feelings, political organi organizations, uh, operations of power, operations of privilege. That's the hard discussion to begin to engage with. And all of a sudden, when you, be, when you put that on the table, economic organization, uh, why do we still have uh, uh, income inequality? Why do we still have wage inequality? That becomes the, the, hard, the, the hard thing to talk about. Oh, yeah. We missed that. And, and then a couple of years ago, your movie uh, elected President Obama. And then two years later, we get this backlash with no, you know, with 
his party loses control of the of Congress and the city. Mm -hmm. And where's the sustainability? Coupled also with the idea that we only get some whites now. Yeah. We have truly, and we're not thinking any deeper than puddle. Just oh, yeah. what do we got? And instant conversations. There's not, there's not the depth that we need. There's not the sustainability that we need mm -hmm. to get that last push. This because, I mean, I, I mentioned King in this talk. Um, you, you remember as early as 1962, 63, uh, you were getting articles in the New York Times about the white backlash against the civil rights movement. This is before the 1963 March on Washington. This is before the 64, 65 Voting Rights Act. Even within the movement, after, after those uh, uh, Voting Rights and Civil Rights Acts of 64 and 65, when they were passed, there was a debate. Baynard Rustin held the view that uh, protest was over, now it's time for politics. King said, let's continue to press on. Remember, King, as early as 1957, said, this black freedom movement, this civil rights movement, is part of a global movement of 800 million people fighting for freedom. Now, in order to continue that, you know, he morphed and developed the Poor People's Campaign. Now, remember, you know, 64, from 64 to 68, really, uh, 66 to 68, King was just, no one liked him. His ideas were like, okay, we're finished with this. But what happens is, we have to, I mean, the, 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 the question that King faced and the question that Du Bois faced with Black Reconstruction. How do you press on in the midst of the counter-revolution? Remember, democracy is never going to come about. Everyone's never going to be on board. And every revolution, uh, as a famous, uh, uh, I think it's uh, Lenin who said this, every revolution mobilizes the counter-revolutionaries. So you're always going to be, it's always going to be a struggle. You know, uh, one thing Fannie Lou Hamer said is it, it, a beautiful saying: "Freedom is a is an endless uh, in, freedom is an endless meeting." We have to develop those internal reservoirs, those deep wells of democracy within ourselves, to continue to battle when no one's around. If you're in a group, you know, say a community group, and you can only get three people out, right? You're like, okay, well, we really got to fight this, but you only you're not going to get a mass group of folks. They're, every day is not going to be March on Washington. It's going to be those small groups that continue to persevere. What happened in Egypt is a prime example. What we saw from, uh, a, a, as a result of the January 25th revolution recently, that did, did, did not start January 25th. It started years and decades before. It ramped up in the past three years. These were community organizations. The leaders of, of that, of what went on in, in Egypt, were community organizations. The US media, you won't get this. One way, you may look at Al Haram, uh, uh, Al Arabiya, or even Al Jazeera English. You'll get better coverage of actually what's going on on the ground. But individuals lost their lives, not only uh, uh, what happened when uh, uh, in, um, uh, in uh, uh, Tahrir Square, not only there, but also uh, prior to. So we have to begin to think that democracy, when we have those windows, those spaces, those openings, that even in Iran, we had three years of an opening. By 82, it had closed. And what we do is learn from those. Hence, we look at Du Bois, we'll look at the Iranian case, see what we can learn, pass that on to future generations, and allow them to continue to struggle. And that's very hard because there are no guarantees. The thing about democracy is it does not facilitate guarantees. It's not structured on a guarantee. Hell, I mean, uh, uh, the founding fathers did not think uh, or did not imagine that this would be a political community in the same way, same shape across space and times. Hence, this is why uh, Thomas Jefferson always advocated a little revolution is good. Because you know what? We didn't think all the good ideas at this one moment. So Jefferson, you know, I'm always quoting Jefferson. I'm from Virginia. I used to teach at UVA. You constantly are inundated with Thomas Jefferson. 
but I present Jefferson as a revolutionary. Jefferson, you got to have these revolutions every so often. We haven't had one in a while. 2008, yeah, a bit of a revolution. Unleashed energy. But there's no more time for a freedom movement. Um, Jennifer, what about the time that you mentioned your religion before? And mm -hmm. it seems to me as though that's, that's an aspect of our American democracy that's not really um, uh, challenged or let's say, put it this way, of that Christianity, the um, all Christian hold on, on um, political life isn't really challenged. Um, yeah, it's kind of assumed like people have to have the right in blood that they're Christians, you know, when they're running for office. Yeah, and, and um, this, uh, my next book that's coming out, uh, Between Transcendence and History, uh, an essay on religion and democracy, uh, takes that up. That's one of the greatest challenges that we have. Uh, Christianity, particularly the way in which it's invoked in politics, uh, creates a mythology. Uh, it weds a virulent fundamentalist Christianity. I mean, the Puritans were some very fundamentalist uh, very hostile, very closed individuals. Um, and this is one reason why they couldn't get along with other Christians in, in, in England. And we have to remember that. That's not, uh, these folks aren't anything to celebrate. I mean, you know, you don't get the Salem witch trials uh, out of nowhere. There's a deep uh, hostility uh, within American fundamentalist uh, religion, uh, American Christianity, um, that we have to begin to think through and excise. And if we don't, we will continue to replicate that, in, 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 that, 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 that hostility such that everyone will have to profess an almost orthodox Christianity to engage in public life. Our last debate, the last debate that we have in American public life is around this, the role of religion. And it is not something that's just a celebratory role. I mean, I, I, I'm a trained theologian. So these, uh, in Christian thought, these are deep battles, uh, deep cleavages. And when we talk about uh, uh, having religious pluralism, it means that, okay, I'll respect your religion as long as it's just like mine. So that's the debate about re uh, uh, Christianity and Islam right now in the US. As long as, as your Islam coordinates with the way I think about my Christianity, it's fine. If it's something different, you got to get out of here. We can't have that. And it means that when we think of democracy as this sort of uh, penultimate value, that democracy causes us to be a little bit humble, even humble about our thoughts on God. We have to be hospitable, open up and welcoming to other views that, may, that run the risk of transforming us. And we got to be a little bit more, uh, um, uh, as I would say, a little less rigid and a little more um, loving and welcoming. And for religion, I mean, it's hard because what? These are God claims. And people stake their lives on them. And this is why the Founding Fathers understood that religion had the possibility not only uh, to bring uh, a political community together, it also holds the seeds of its destruction. And if we don't learn how to talk about this Christianity, this American religion, uh, that's going to be our destruction. Now, that's kind of sad to end on. <laughs> right? It's like, hey, this dude, ain't, you know, he, ain't no, he, he don't like America. He ain't he talking about Christianity, you know? <laughs> We're going to call our congressperson, get him out of here. Go back to Brown, that liberal school. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And the congresswoman, and um, I remember watching. Um, I mean, I, I I really don't like Fox News. I have a lot of issues with it, but I remember I do watch it occasionally, so I get the other perspective. And I remember Britt Hume, who was a very um, very Christian conservative um, commentator, had said that um, he thought that. The fact that it opened up with a Native American ceremony, um, he found that bizarre and weird. And I thought to myself, this is a man who is uh, an, a reporter. He is representing himself, 
Um, and he's calling a Native American culture, which is something beautiful and we should be to tolerant of this, he's calling it bizarre and weird. And I think that's very dangerous language. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, that's what we have to contend with. We have these reactionary kind of fundamentalist people who believe it has to be the Christian way is the only way and everything else is, is, a, is deviant. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, I just wonder, you know, what, what, what do you think about comments that are made like that and how they're not repudiated like immediately, especially if they're coming from Fox, Fox News? Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I, I, um, I tend to, I tend to uh, approach it like this. I mean, I tend to think that in, in certain uh, political discourses, uh, we all construct these uh, straw people. So uh, those on the political spectrum always, you know, create a boogeyman out of news media. And I'm like, you know, all of it is just bad. I mean, you know, you got Fox, you got MSNBC, and I'm just like, both of them is just, you know, for students, they're just bad examples of bad thinking, simplistic forms of thinking. None of them can rap, grapple with the depth of the issues that we have there. So I, I, I don't even engage them because, you know, you, you know, uh, I guess it was uh, Keith Oberman, right, who just lost his job. I was like, you know, who cares? I mean, this dude, he, it, was, it was bad thinking. I mean, I don't expect Brett Hume to come out with a profound analysis of what's going on in a, in a, in a ritual ceremony around uh, death. I just don't. I don't look for that. Uh, I don't expect them to. I mean, I would expect if one of my students were to say something like that, who had been in my class, then I would I'd call that student up and they're like, look, hold up. You know, you got to have a better analysis than that, right? I mean, that's what education, that's why y'all are here. Otherwise, it's just like, you know, no. And the, the challenge that we have is to, we, I mean, there's a golden opportunity. Look, we got closed doors right here. We got everyone in here. If everyone in here continues to develop critical thinking skills, all of us, imagine what force we'd be coming right here out of Bristol Community College. It would be amazing. They couldn't account for it. In many ways, they can't account for the possibility or the probability that people will begin to think and to organize and to then construct an alternative world, irregardless of the nonsense that's going on. In many ways, if, if uh, Du Bois were reading the newspapers of his day and writing Black Reconstruction, remember, this is a time of Scottsboro. This is the 1930s. Uh, you're still having uh, lynching of, of African Americans. If he were preoccupied with that, black reconstruction would have never come out. I mean, if King were preoccupied with the negative press that he received, there would never have been a, a civil rights movement. If even, you know, I, I hate to talk about uh, the, uh, the president, President Obama, because he gets invoked every time. It's like, you know, everybody got a, you know, Obama this. I'm like, damn, leave the brother alone. <laughs> I mean, you know, he the president. I mean, he, he's not the head of the PTO, so he ain't going to do what we think he's going to do. He's not the head of our local union. No, nah, he's the president of an empire. 734 foreign military bases, uh, over 2 million soldiers stationed abroad, or 1.2 million soldiers stationed abroad. We should not expect that one person will change the U.S., not even the president. So I just put him in the category, yeah, I mean, he's, he's the office. I mean, King said in 1964 on the BBC that he imagined 25 years uh, af af from 1964 that there would be a black president. So it wasn't unimaginable that Obama got elected in 2008. So I just throw all that stuff away. I mean, it was just like hyperbole. And even some of my colleagues in the academy were saying that. And I said, how can you say that? I mean, uh, you know, you had people like George Washington Woodby. You had folks uh, like James Ford in 1932 running for vice president of the United States. He was running as a communist in the Communist Party. But, you know, uh, Charlene Mitchell ran for president of the United States in 1968. Shirley Chisholm ran for the Democratic nomination in 72. I mean, Charlene Mitchell, she's still alive in New York City, ran for president in 68, was denied Secret Service protection in 68. Why? Because she ran as uh, the candidate for the CPUSA. I mean, the question becomes, 
how do we imagine our political, uh, our political culture, and then how do we act upon it? Knowing that they're nonsense, and as we have you know, uh, more media technologies that continue to squeeze our time, I mean, Twitter, right? You got 135 uh, characters, right, if you tweet. And I think, this, the, I think young people are just moving beyond Twitter. I think old folks now are coming on, right? And as more and more old people start uh, tweeting, young folks like, yo, let's, this, this is old, you know. Uh, I think young people are going to start reading long books now. <laughs> I think we're going to see the reviving of, of book culture with the young folks, not with Twitter. There's too many old people tweeting now. <laughs> and everybody trying to, you know, I, I just did this. And, yeah. <laughs> young folks don't want to know what old people are doing. Y'all old. Nasty. Ugh. Like TMI, too much information, right? I don't need to know that. Go ahead, Ron. Are we finished? Sort of allegiance to what you're saying is um, you talk about democracy I and mean, yeah. you talk about participation. And uh, one thing, the young people do not participate in this, uh, our democracy to any extent that uh, older people do. Mm -hmm. And we get the result we get is like 15% of the population ends up electing reactionaries, as you see in Congress. And young people don't know what's going on. I mean, I haven't taught here for years and years. Most of our students don't understand the basics of our government, you know, different between state, local, federal. And they also, they have a hard time getting things out. Like, oh, this is a great crowd, but I don't see the young people raising their hand. You raised some wonderful questions here. And it's the teachers who are asking the questions. Mm -hmm. Why aren't young people raising some of these questions? Uh, they, uh, they, they, questions they bored. How, how do we get <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's Sam. Yeah. I mean, I know I ain't say everything. Yeah. I mean, that's the, the, that's the, the I mean, that's, that's a huge, uh, last year, uh, Ron came down to Brown and we had uh, the 50th anniversary of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, reunion, 50th anniversary. And these were students much like yourself. Uh, Charlie Cobb, uh, who organized it with me. Uh, Charlie Cobb, who's one of the founders uh, uh, of SNCC, uh, um, went down to Mississippi. He was sitting at Howard University in Washington, D.C., reading a student newspaper, learning about uh, the Nonviolent um, non Action Group, NAG. Uh, as they, their acronym, NAG. Uh, and this is the group that Stokely Carmichael came out of. Uh, Charlie was sitting there and then said, okay, well, I'm gonna go down and get some training in Texas. And next thing you know, he's on a bus down. He stops in uh, Mississippi and there he, he, he meets um, uh, Hollis Watkins. And Hollis says, you know, why are you going to Texas? Here's the movement right here. Next thing you know, he spends the next uh, six or seven years in Mississippi. Didn't know where to start. Didn't know how to begin. Uh, there was no blueprint. I mean, this is the one thing you got. There is no blueprint for democracy. You know, I think, ain't there a, a, I, I hate making these references to rap music because it's so cliche. Didn't somebody just do an album called The Blueprint? One or two? Yeah. I mean, that dude older than me, and I'm just like, you know. <laughs> How is he writing the, the sound the, the soundtrack to young people's lives? And I'm like, this is like true media uh, media manipulation. This dude is older than me. Can y'all imagine me writing the soundtrack to your life? You know, I got some skills, but come on, I mean, be critical about this stuff. Uh, you know, he should have came out with a you know a different generation. You know, when he had more you know, competition for people his own age. I mean, I wouldn't go into class and say, oh yeah, I'm smarter than my students. You know, he's the best rapper. And you, Lil Wayne, I mean, that's like, it's like your brother. I mean, your little baby brother or something like that. I don't know. But there's no, you know, there is no blueprint. There are no, there are no uh, plans written uh, prior to. You just begin. I mean, the beautiful thing, I mean, when I talk about democracy as a promise uh, in Du Bois, it's uh, owed to uh, my reading of, um, this idea of the promise uh, in uh, this, the late uh, French philosopher Jacques Derrida. 
And what Derrida reminds us of is that when we posit that there's a beginning, it's not the absolute beginning. It's the moment where we start. That's it. There is no original moment that we can actually point to and say, it starts right here, absolutely. No one can say where an idea of freedom began. We know where expressions of freedom uh, become practices of freedom. You know, in the uh, Christian religion, there's always this, the beginning of the, uh, of the Christian text and of the Jewish text as well begins with in the beginning. But it doesn't say what the beginning is. It just says in the beginning. And in many ways, for young people, you can't be stifled by not knowing where to begin. You just begin. You know something's wrong. Yeah, you, you know something's wrong. It may be beginning right in the class. I mean, you know, you read text and be like, well, something's wrong here. I got I to gotta figure this out. I got to do something. And that's what, I mean, that's that beginning. Something is wrong. White supremacy? Yeah. I don't, I mean, in a sense, uh, there's a level of consciousness and unconsciousness about this. And what I'm, what I, what I'm just, what I'm saying is this. Um, there are those in power who will continue to perpetuate and keep power the way it is because it facilitates uh, individuals keeping and maintaining their privilege and their position. But there's a way in which our uh, structures of thinking inhibit us from thinking po uh, new, um, new uh, ideas about democracy. So we have to, we think that this is about race, right? Because that's the lingua franca, that's the category that's given. But when we begin to think quite differently, and this is what Du Bois becomes uh, an architect of, how do we think differently about what we've received, about our received traditions? It then opens us up to begin to conceive what these problems are. And this isn't a problem of race, which then becomes, which is then read as why black people don't act, don't act right or don't act white, uh, if you will. It is a problem of white supremacy. I mean, um, I have a number of colleagues who talk about the incarceration crisis, right? And as a former prison chaplain, you know, I, I don't engage in those debates in the academy because it's like, you know, come on. How did black people get here? They got here in chains. So this is nothing new. The penal state is nothing new. How do you think you get from, I mean, how do you think you get to the penal state from the plantation or outside of the plantation? This is nothing new. So the question we have to ask is not, you know, it's, it's not a question just about, it's not a reformist question. It's a question of, of deep radical thinking. At the root, what is the problem of our political community? Now see, that ain't gonna help you in your classes. <laughs> I mean, it'll get you in trouble. I mean, I got my first degree in finance, but I used to go into the humanities classes and just wreck havoc. Right? Because first of all, they didn't know political economy. Second of all, they didn't have a critical understanding of history. But you got to keep pressing on. I mean, even as a prison chaplain, I got, a, I got in arguments with the warden. Because they didn't want freedom and liberation. They just wanted to better acclimate the, prison, the prisoners to the environment. And I said, well, I don't do that. Because these people are not prisoners. So now you like, well, what do you, you know, how, how, do I, how do I actualize that? It may be doing something different in class. It may be organizing with your comrades right in, in this room. It may be taking a critical look at what's going on. I mean, I know there are going to be some cuts coming down uh, in the community college system here in Massachusetts, right? Now, I know there are deep issues here in Fall River, you know? Uh, I know there are deep issues around uh, plural. How do we have a, a plural, uh, a plural democracy here in Fall River? 
it's going to begin with young people. Don't look at old people. Don't look at your professors. Don't look at us. I mean, we're going to we'll sell you out in a second. I mean, you know, we got to we, we worried about our paycheck, you know, house note, you know, Social Security, you know. <laughs> We'll eat up Social Security before, and then say, ain't, no good, ain't gonna be no Social Security for you. Yeah, and the question you gotta say is, that ain't the issue. I mean, if you created Social Security in the middle of, of the Depression, then why the hell we can't create something right now? That's the question, but see, that ain't entertained. This is as if you, uh, and remember, Social Security uh, uh, outlawed black folk. I mean, black people were not part of Social Security at the beginning, right? We had to fight for that. But, that's when you realize things can change. Let me grab this this one right quick. Go ahead, bro. Uh huh. It seems that democracy never seems to grow because a lot of people take whatever someone else says into context immediately. Especially when someone talks about race, or talks about how someone feels towards each other. Especially when uh, the teacher was talking about how the person from Fox was saying, "Oh, this is weird." Mm -hmm. A lot of people might have thought that he was saying it seriously, even if he was just bashing on that. Whatever that was. The like, hey, it's weird because it's not what we're used to. We never used to this type of area. I was wondering how you felt towards how would democracy keep growing when everyone just wants to defend themselves and don't let don't let themselves take these small little instances because you can't really have something grow without taking some damage first. You can't see a revolution happen without spilling some blood to see how it can grow and how they feel towards each other. CLR always CLR James always said, Don't play with revolution. You'll never know what comes back of it, what, come, what will come uh, uh, back to you. It goes back to that, that question of hospitality, being open. And in many ways, uh, we, we, our culture is not a culture of openness. It is a culture that continues to instill a closeness and a superiority and an inability to begin to think quite differently. Uh, and this is what Du Bois tried to, to, tried to point us towards. That if we could reconceive democracy coming to America in the experience of African Americans uh, in the Reconstruction era, and, the, and what they attempted to accomplish as legislators, as everyday people organizing uh, communities, then we could possibly quite, think quite differently about our political community. Now, there always are going to be, now I'm not trying to give you uh, this pie in the sky. Remember, democracy is always contentious. And the reason why it's contentious is because people hold different values and people prioritize those values quite differently. So everybody is not going to have the same uh, uh, values, priorities as everyone else. But if we are committed to that principle of hospitality, of radical openness, and the risk of changing ourselves, then maybe uh, that will be, you know, that will be the inauguration of a sustaining journey to democracy. Remember, we're not at there yet, and, and we should never think we are there. But we should see ourselves as, uh, as, a, as members uh, proceeding on a journey towards a destination that we can faintly see. You know, it's on the horizon, but it continues to uh, go beyond go beyond us. 